almost the entire community at one time or another as you go through the intersection. So it's uh, definitely key. From a planning perspective, uh, the city, you know, over every few years looks at the transportation network as a whole. Uh, we analyze the system, we look at the different roads that uh, need improvements, and this intersection has been identified uh, as one that needs improvement, right? It's probably pretty obvious to folks in the room. Uh, as growth has continued throughout uh, campus' history, obviously there's more traffic, uh, the congestion has gotten worse at the intersection. So it's been uh, on the radar, so to speak. Um, in 2017, uh, the city council started going through a strategic plan process, a three-year strategic plan for 2018 through 2020. And in that uh, plan, council had set a goal uh, or a priority that we look at the SR500 every corridor, and with that, specifically look at the intersection and try and figure out a plan to move forward, because we knew that congestion had continued to get worse uh, through time. So, Basically, in uh, 2018, we got started on this in earnest. We were lucky enough to get some uh, low-interest loan financing through the state, and that allowed us then to, to basically start the project, and we kicked it off in late December. We went through a, a data collection process uh, where we went out and did surveys, we looked at the environmental and did some investigations, uh, and started the public outreach process in earnest, and we'll get into that uh, more as we go through here. And then that led to an alternatives analysis, which is basically just looking at the different options that might work to be able to solve the problem that we're having. And then that moved us through into design. And then now that we're essentially finishing the design process and we're moving into construction, that would be the last phase. And so right now we're hoping that uh, construction starts here later this spring. So the public outreach process uh, has been key. We've known from the beginning that, uh, again, the intersection impacts uh, the entire community. And so we wanted to make sure uh, that whatever solution we came up with fits the needs of the community. So you know, our role as the project team was essentially gather all the data that we can, make sure that the public and the community knows uh, what, what we're dealing with, what the true issues are, get feedback from the community, and then use that feedback to lead um, you know, city council the project through a process to get to a solution that we know the community actually wants and that will actually solve the problem. So from day one, uh, it's been a very deliberate process to go through, and, and that's, uh, again, some of the history that we wanted to share tonight. Uh, as we went through, you'll see a number of things. There's a couple of slides here uh, we had initially I think I went one too far tonight. Yep. So we started off early with stakeholder committees uh, or interviews, if you will. So we had a group of, of folks that we talked to. That the intent was let's let's talk to some people in the community, figure out what they think is going to be important as we start this journey, and we figure out uh, what we need to do at the intersection. Uh, we had a project advisory committee that we set up, and the, the idea there was that they were at the table with us along the, the way through design and through the alternatives analysis to figure out, uh, you know, help us figure out what was important and keep us on track and look at some of the technical details with us. Uh, we did a couple of different surveys. I think we had over 1,500 responses between the two surveys, so pretty, pretty significant turnout on the surveys. That was uh, very helpful. Uh, this is our third open house or community public meeting. Um, I don't know, just out of curiosity, how many people were at the uh, first two open houses on this one? Good? <laughs> Half or one, one or two, great. That's, that's awesome. So this is our third one. Looks about the same. I think the first two we had between 100 and 120 people at each. Uh, so this is pretty similar, I think, which is great. Um, and then uh, we had uh, the, uh, as we got further, we had a landscape committee that also helped us. So it was important for um, the team and the project to understand what do we want this to look like. You know, whatever the fix is, whether it's signal, whether it's roundabout, whether it's whatever it is, let's make sure that it fits with the surrounding area because obviously the, the natural resources here are super important. Uh, a lot of recreation happens, and so let's make sure that it, it looks good and it feels right as you drive through. 
And then along the way, we had uh, city council meetings as well. There's a couple of them that were shown on the slides here, but uh, in reality, we checked in with them uh, a number of times, trying to make sure that we were keeping them in the loop and that they were uh, you know, satisfied with the direction that the project was heading and, and being able to make those decisions to move forward. So we've got some videos. Um, you'll see three of them here tonight in the presentation. Uh, a little bit hard to see, I think, but basically we, with pretty much any project, you wanna start with what happens if we don't do anything, right? So we're sitting here today, we know that in a planning horizon in 20 years is what we typically look at, uh, what's gonna happen. Can I run that again? Oh, okay. So this represents the what happens if we don't do anything uh, in 20 years, and it's uh, so it's called the no-build option in 2040, and you can see the the stack of cards, right? So it, it's very significant. Uh, if a pedestrian happens to hit the the crosswalk button and cross on Everett, right? Everybody knows even today it backs up all directions. Uh, pretty significant, right? Uh, some of you are probably laughing and saying, "Hey." 2040, it looks like that right now, right? And that's, I think I saw that from a couple of people. So obviously, right, we know we have to do something. The no-build alternative probably isn't a reality. We've, we've got to do something to fix the intersection. So that takes us to an alternatives analysis, uh, which again, is really just looking at the different options and seeing what we think might work. But um, it's key, again, for us to figure out what what it is the community wants out of this project and to help guide the solutions. And so we looked at um, seven different alternatives, and that includes the no-build alternative, but then there was, for those of you that have been involved in the process, there were three signal uh, options or alternatives, and there were three roundabout alternatives. They all did the trick. They could all work, they could all move the traffic through and, and help the congestion uh, in the area, but um, again, we wanted to find the best fit for the community and make sure that, um, that we were getting what people wanted. Um, you know, roundabouts are roundabouts and signals, right? Uh, across the country, people can love them, people cannot love them. Um, you, you find people on all sides. And so we wanted uh, an objective process to go through that, again, took the values of the community and, and helped us along. So when we looked at different... Um, things to consider. We talked with the stakeholder group, uh, we talked with the project advisory committee, and we developed a list of evaluation criteria. And as you can see, I mean, we've tried to hit uh, pretty much everything that we heard from folks that they felt were important. Uh, so we had public impacts, traffic impacts, environmental impacts, and infrastructure. And then underneath all of those major categories, you see things like the construction cost, uh, tree impacts and uh, lake and wetland impacts, uh, you know, private property impacts, public property impacts as well, for that matter, pedestrian safety and bicycle safety, that came out uh, as, as a key criteria as well. So we wanted to use this evaluation criteria to, again, help us figure out which alternative might work the best. So we sent out a public survey, uh, and then also I think one of the open houses fell uh, within that same time frame. And we had uh, citizens tell us what, what do you think is important? And so the survey had, um, it actually had all of the criteria that was listed on the previous slide for folks to look at and essentially rank in their mind what they felt was the most important. And of all of the criteria, uh, the five that are up here uh, rose to the top. I'd say in reality, though, everything that you saw on that previous slide, folks believed was important, right? That's, uh, there wasn't any doubt about that. But reduce traffic congestion, uh, maintain traffic flow during construction, improve traffic safety, uh, reasonable construction schedule, and accommodate pedestrian and bicycle access. Those were the five that rose to the top. Uh, but again, the others weren't far behind. Uh, so we took all of the results that we uh, heard from the citizens in the survey and uh, crunched a little bit of math 
and applied the evaluation criteria to all seven alternatives. And you can see what we came out with here. So the three roundabout options, which are on the right side of the screen on the bottom, uh, all actually scored higher than the signal alternatives. And then uh, it's worth noting that the no build alternative, when you apply the criteria, it's like we did to all the other alternatives, it actually scores pretty well, uh, but it doesn't solve the problem. And when you think about it, some of the things we were looking at was cost. Well, there's no cost if you're, you know, you're not building anything. There's no environmental impact if you're not building anything. So there was a reason why it scored higher, but uh, in reality, again, it's not really uh, an alternative that I think we wanted to consider uh, fully here. So, hmm. We skipped one, yeah. Uh, so similar to the no build option, these simulations that we created, uh, they help us, help everybody, I think, visualize uh, what some of the options uh, would look like on the ground, uh, so to speak. And so we used uh, the models to look at both the signal and the roundabout options. So this was part of the analysis, essentially. And this basically takes the traffic analysis, if you will, and puts it uh, in a visual mode so that folks can see what happens. I want to back up here and we'll play it. It doesn't like that one. One more try. All right. So you can see with this one, it, with the signal, right, it works. Uh, but the the number of lanes and the the overall impacts were there's a reason why it didn't score very well with the evaluation criteria, basically, and all of those things that add up. Um, so you can see Lake Road gets wide, and there's five lanes across there. There's two lanes that uh, would allow you to turn northbound which means then you have two lanes uh, going towards the bridge, right? So you can accept the people turning. And then that means in our current configuration, you would have to merge before you got to the bridge. Uh, so that's key. Or include the bridge in the project, which uh, at this point, you know, from a financial standpoint, just uh, is infeasible. Uh, and then heading on the south leg, um, you know, that's also why there's, there's a number of environmental impacts. And in fact, the signal, uh, alternative that scored the highest uh, actually on the environmental impact was about equal with the roundabouts. It's, it's hard to imagine, but the, the amount of widening and the impact to the, uh, to the trees and the sensitive areas that are there is actually pretty significant with the signal as well. So, and then you still have the same trouble with the pedestrian, for example. They get the light here in this scenario and, and the crosswalk. Uh, and they cross Everett, that pretty much blocks a lot of the intersection. And some of the right turns can go, but it, it still clogs things up. So that was the signal, and then the roundabout, and we finally want to go to that, um, works pretty well. So, you know, when you look at it, there are some of the impacts uh, on the environmental side, but again, very similar to the signal when you take them, uh, add them up as a whole. Um, the roundabout creates uh, number of gaps just naturally for those of you that are familiar with the roundabouts we have, you know the one at 6th and Norwood um, by the way people talk about the one on Brady Road just for the record that's actually not a city of Canvas roundabout that's a, a city of Vancouver roundabout um, but they create gaps naturally which is going to help uh, the cars flow through and uh, be able to access the, the road from uh, you know the private property businesses to the south, and then also the roads to the north. There's gaps that are provided. And then a pedestrian, uh, which I don't, does this one have a pedestrian? Yeah, so there's, they're really hard to see if you look at the screen over there. When a pedestrian crosses, you cross one lane at a time. So the rest of the roundabout, right, is continuing to, to flow um, and get across. And so, yeah, so you can see the pedestrians crossing there. So again, visualization you know, kind of helps put the, the traffic analysis uh, you know, to a point where people can see it and understand it. So that brings us to the selected alternative or option, if you will, the intersection that's shown here, and there's a number of graphics around the room, but um, you know, a number of things when we look at this, and we've talked about some of them along the way, but uh, first thing to note is that this is sideways. Uh, north is 
actually to the right. Uh, Lake Road is towards the top of the screen, and then south is to the left. So on the left there you see uh, Campus Produce and Cup of Joy and Blacksmith Village. So the roundabout and the selective alternative is actually pulled south and east. Uh, the, the existing intersection is uh, generally about where the triangle is, the sidewalk uh, kind of pedestrian area. That's, that's where the existing intersection is. So you can see how far east and south the roundabout is pulled. Uh, that allowed us to do a number of things. It limits the, the private property impacts. Uh, it limits the impacts to the uh, Lackness Park parking lot, right? So we're able to transition back in and uh, get back onto the existing alignment of Everett uh, right at the parking lot. Um, folks are still able to see as they come out of that parking lot. You can There's sight distance so that you can see cars coming through the roundabout and then past the chestnut tree. Yes, good question. So the city does own this land um, on this side, on the east side of the intersection. Um, so other, other advantages here, uh, the design in general, we uh, extended the sidewalk uh, all the way to Fallen Leaf Lake. Lake. It's, it's actually off the screen here, but it goes all the way to the entrance to Fallen Leaf Lake, Lake. So there would be, or will be, a uh, sidewalk connection all the way from here from the lodge to Baldwin Leaf Lake, and then you could go back around to uh, Lackness Park as well. The the left turn lane uh, or center turn lane that's provided uh, south of the intersection, so that access into Campus Produce and Cup of Joy and Lackness Village will be easier to uh, get in and out of. Um, again, we've talked about the pedestrians and crossing the road. Uh, you know, roundabouts are generally deemed to be safer than signals. Um, in a roundabout, a pedestrian, when you cross, you're crossing one lane and you're only looking one direction, right? You're basically looking for the cars uh, coming from one, one way only, and so a uh, lot, lot less decisions to make, I guess, as a pedestrian and as a driver. Um, let's see, some of the other uh, items with pedestrians. The one crossing um, farthest to the east uh, that would get you, or I'm sorry, the north, that would get you to Lackamas uh, Park. That one's far enough away from the intersection that we're going to have a, a lighted crossing. So it's one of those where you walk up, you hit the button, the LED lights flash to let the cars know that there's a pedestrian crossing. Uh, hopefully they stop for you, like they should, and then you're able to cross the road uh, safer there. The um, that same crossing, it's a little bit hard to see with the light, but the, the chestnut tree, uh, for those of you that have been following the process, we were able to uh, save the chestnut tree. That was also a process that we went through where we got uh, public input on which roundabout option they liked better. There was one that we had shown that's very similar that uh, was pushed a little bit further to the west that would uh, remove the chestnut tree and uh, community essentially let us know that no, that was important, let's try and save that. And it actually is a great uh, feature, I think, of the entire design is that it fits nicely in that big island. Uh, we'll have a plaque of some sort to, that talks a little bit about the tree and the history, uh, maybe how it fits in the project. We'll still have to figure the wording out there. But, um, so trees in general, that's been another big question that we've had along the way. It's something that we've had a lot of discussion on. Uh, again, it's a city-owned parcel uh, that's on the east side of the existing intersection. There's a number of trees in there. And this, this option uh, definitely requires removal of trees. Um, so did the signal, many of the signal options did as well. But this one in particular, I think folks looked at and thought, well, we're taking a lot of trees out. And there's, there are some that are coming out, definitely. A lot of those are already in poor health or they're hazard trees already um, and need to come out. Uh, and, and I think a lot of this uh, you know, area that is impacted by the, the construction of the project, the, it's, it's offset by the benefits that we get from this, uh, from this alignment and this layout. So at the end of the day, uh, this alignment helps us minimize um, disruptions during construction. So Greg will talk about that here in a couple of minutes, but the 
really big advantage that you can get a lot of the roundabout constructed outside of the existing traffic lanes. So that's that's something that this alignment allowed us to do. Uh, it um, minimizes. Um, oh, sorry, I lost lost my train of thought. It's from a cost alternative standpoint. It's actually one of the lower cost options as well. In fact, it was the lowest cost alternative, and so that was another advantage of, of having this alignment. Um, we talked about the chestnut tree and being able to save that. And then any of the trees, we do have a, a handful of trees that are um, going to be removed outside of the project limits um, between the roundabout and the, the slough area. And those trees, we're going to make sure that the contractor doesn't use heavy equipment to get back there and remove any of those trees. Again, they're hazard trees and in poor condition, but they're going to go back there with uh, you know, manual labor essentially and, and take those trees down and then a lot of those are going to be left for habitat or um, used on the project and we'll look at the landscape design here shortly but we're going to make some benches out of the trees, uh, they'll be a part of some of the landscape features that you'll, that you'll see as part of the roundabout. So we're able to you know, take that, uh, what we're removing and be able to use that on the project and then lastly on that we are planting I think over 450 trees uh, on that east side, and then I think over 1,200 uh, different variety of native shrubs uh, that'll go in as well. So the idea, and removing a lot of the invasive species as well, so the IAB and, and other invasive species. And I think at the end, you know, the idea is to have a much healthier uh, natural habitat there when we're done with the project than what's there today, because it's it is. Uh, there is some care and some love that, that needs to happen back there, uh, and so we'll try and make sure we follow through on that with the project. With that, uh, the last thing was the landscape. Oh, I'll steal my thunder here. It's not my Robert did a nice job with this. So we uh, also we had a landscape committee like i said early on and uh just again with the location where this is at we wanted to make sure that it fits with the feel uh the natural environment and again what the community wants to see here and i think even this view you get a sense of all of the areas that we get to take advantage of to plant and uh, be able to have kind of a natural setting as you walk through here so that when you cross the intersection if you're a pedestrian uh, you know, hopefully it feels like you're still in the wooded areas and you're not in the middle of a six-lane intersection, uh, you know, on one of the busy streets on a state highway, for example. This, this will have a lot different feel to it. So this will I'll end here and let this fly through. So it just gives you a little bit different perspective of the full design. So this is headed uh, north. Central Island is pretty simple. There's uh, three larger trees in there and some rock and some plantings. And then the chestnut tree on the left that just slid by. That's the lighted crosswalk right there. So again, just crossing one lane at a time. And then this is kind of a, a pedestrian gathering place, if you will. There's some of the wood benches that we talked about. We'll swing around on Lake Road and kind of get a bigger view from up on top. So we're really able to take advantage. It, it looks like a, you know, I think I've heard the term of, I don't know, spaghetti, spaghetti leg intersection. I've heard all kinds of things as people have seen uh, some of the drawings, but when you're in it, and you're driving it, there's going to be signs. Uh, you're only, again, with a roundabout, it specifically uh, reduces the, the number of options that you have to think about. Uh, and so you're really just looking one way and you're pulling out and you're driving around the, the roundabout and you're following the arrows and the signage to go where you want to go. So it it'll, should be a lot simpler uh, when you're there driving through it than it might look on paper. But there's also reasons for the different lanes that we can talk about if people have questions. I think it's coming back down to the south here. 
And with that, I'm actually going to hand it over to Greg Jellison. He's with PDS Engineering. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the construction uh, and what you can expect moving forward here with the schedule. Thanks, Steve. As Steve said, I'm Greg Jellison. I'm the Principal Civil Engineer with PBS and Project Manager for this project. Uh, really enjoyed getting to work with the, the city and, and the public here on this. So during construction, so the, the overall construction schedule we anticipate being actually late March on into the fall. We don't know exactly the exact time frame yet, but it's going to be substantially complete and open to traffic is our, our plan is that once everything falls into place by late October. And uh, so, but there are three main construction stages, what we call staging of the construction. And that's because to do this, we have to, there is no good detour for this area, as everybody knows. So everybody has to go through it. So we need to make one of the main criteria of the evaluation is was uh, maintaining traffic flow during construction. So how are we going to accomplish that? So we have to come up with a way to build this while traffic is still using Everett. And so um, the first stage is the, has the vast majority of the construction that's going to occur. And as, as uh, uh, Steve mentioned, the intersection, the roundabout has shifted to the south and to the east significantly from where the existing intersection is now. And you can see um, where, this, oh, I just showed it off. <laughs> Did again? I thought that was a laser pointer. Here we go. Anyway, so as you can see, the, the roundabout is to the south and to the east of the existing intersection. The existing intersection is shown where that signal uh, is. And so during the first stage of construction, the traffic will be driving where it drives today. Right? So the contractor will be working significantly on the, on the east side uh, in the city-owned parcel there where the trees are. So the first steps will be the, the removal of the trees that are going to be necessary to be removed. Um, and then the various components that are, that are not under traffic will be getting worked on the side, you know, one side of Everett Street, the other side of Everett Street, and those frontage widenings or frontage improvements. And so there's, there's hazard tree removal, there's the, the travel path, is the green is where cars are going to be, and then the construction zone. And then you can see the turning path is just what it is today. So it, it, that first stage, a lot of work is going to be happening while you're still using the same existing roadway. There's also um, some, the pedestrian routes will be similar. We'll obviously have to um, make sure that it's safe. So we have temporary pedestrian access routes for people to be able to get to the park and walk through there. Because it is, as everybody knows, it's a heavy, heavily pedestrian used area. So stage two. So this one is the probably the biggest impact to the traveling public is stage two. And one of the main reasons, so August, right? So school starts at the end of August, beginning of September. So one of the critical path items is to make sure that stage one gets built by the end of July so that we can do stage two in August. And during August, this stage would have a temporary signal. So the existing signal would be modified to be a temporary signal. And what would happen is this roundabout, the new roundabout, would be partially constructed. It, it would be partially then open to traffic. And the, and the traffic would travel through. So as you're coming down Lake Road, and uh, you would either be turning, you, you'd go straight through that signal. And so even if you want to turn left, you're going to go straight through that signal, go around the roundabout, and go north. Okay? So that's, that's how a left turn would work. We're not going to have you turning left at that because that's one of the critical movements that slows down the, the operation of the signal. And we have a roundabout we can partially use. Northbound traffic would not have to go through the signal at all, right? So they would be coming into the roundabout and continuing north on that new leg that goes to the uh, east of the chestnut tree. So that traffic is also taken out of the signal. So then the southbound traffic has to go through the signal still, so right turns and then the through traffic would then go through that. Um, and so then that's how it would operate. But like I said, this is probably the biggest impact to existing traffic of the entire project that's going to be happening during this stage. So that's why we're trying to keep it as short as possible. And while that's being built, you can see the, the construction zone is the brown. Those are all the pieces of the new roundabout, the new intersection that are where the existing road sits today. 
So that's why we have to route traffic around that, because obviously we have to build over the existing uh, state highway. Then stage three, um, the roundabout is pretty much fully operational, except for the various little pieces that we still have where we had temporary traffic uh, going. We have to finish up the curbs and the islands, and then the landscape areas where the pedestrian, the new pedestrian routes are, that was where the old intersection was, basically, the existing intersection. So all of those are getting built at that time and finished up. So that's the, the cleanup, basically, of, of the various pieces of the, uh, of the intersection. The landscaping, obviously we'll go, so this is October. Landscaping is not happening. I mean, some of it will get built in the roundabout so at that time. But the planting of all the plants, there's a lot of trees that get planted. As uh, Steve mentioned, like over 1,200 shrubs and you know, 450, 460 trees. A lot of those trees you can't even get, like the bare root trees that we're going to be putting in, you can't even get until December time frame. So a lot of, and, and you shouldn't be planting them until late fall or into the winter anyway. So there will still be work going on out there, and landscape work on late into fall and early winter, but the roadway will be open to traffic, and then there may be flagging along the side, and there still may be some congestion due to the, the work along the road, but the road, the project will be substantially complete and open to, open to traffic to be able to use it that point. So that's the plan as far as making sure that everything falls into place. It's, a, it's an aggressive schedule, but it's an important one to be able to accomplish, like I said, stage two, get that completed prior to school starting. And that's one of our main goals, because that's obviously when school starts back up, um, that's a very heavy traffic time in September. Um, we know that in the summertime, there's a lot of pedestrians, and as I said, during all these stages, we'll make sure that they have temporary pedestrian access routes through there to first safely be able to traverse the project during construction. So thank you, and I'll give this back to Steve for a Q&A. Thank you. So uh, I have to say I failed uh, one of my jobs up here tonight, and that was to uh, recognize all of our committee members. Um, some of them, there's I think just a small handful here in the room tonight, but I do want to I do want to recognize them because they, they spent some late evenings with us. Uh, Greg likes to talk, so we were in our meetings for a long time. Uh, they got some cookies out of the deal, but that's that's about it. So they, they gave us some of their time, which is definitely appreciated. Uh, so Brent Erickson, Carrie Schulstad, Emma Cox, Galena Burley, Kevin Tyler, Lauren Hollenbeck, Matt Ransom, Randy Miller, Rick Keniston, Tamara Allison, so uh, and Ali Algaresha uh, was also there, and so that was our project advisory committee. So thank you, everybody. If, if you'd like, you can stand up or wave. Um, and then our landscape advisory committee: uh, Bonnie Carter, Steve Lorenz, uh, Lauren Hollenbeck, Dennis Ryan, Dan Corlett. Karen Bork and Mary Marquand all helped us out on that, so thank you. So question and answer, again, we're happy to uh, stay up here and answer as many questions as we can. Again, we are being uh, recorded and live streamed, so it would be great if we could get your questions on the mic. Uh, we've got two microphones here. Uh, if you want to come up when you have a question, uh, use the microphone ask your question, you're welcome to stay there or sit back down uh, when you're done. If you can't make it up to the, one of the microphones, uh, again, we can pull these off the stand and bring them out to you in the audience. More than happy to do that as well for folks that might have questions that uh, can't make it up to the microphone. Uh, so with that, uh, happy to entertain questions. Del Turner, I live on 35th Avenue up in the hill. My question is the funding on this. Now, from my understanding that SR 500 and Everett are synonymous, and considering that we all pay gas taxes, that the state is responsible for that particular roadway. So, 
I understand that there is a grant involved in it. Is that the state's contribution to this project? Yeah, so let me uh, answer your question a couple of different ways. Uh, one is that we didn't cover actually funding in the presentation, which um, definitely should have. Um, the project as a whole right now is estimated between seven and eight million dollars for a total project cost. So that's design, permitting, construction. Uh, we do have a grant. So uh, earlier this, I guess last fall, we were uh, successful in applying for uh, the state grant, and that's 3.3 million dollars. So that's free money that we don't have to pay back as a city or use other funds. And then the remainder of the funds, we have a uh, low interest loan also through the state, which was a competitive process, and we were successful with that. So that's the remainder of the funding. So that's just a broad brush overview. The uh, watchdog participation um, from, a, from a big picture statewide priority perspective in, in WashDOT, they, they look at things a little bit differently, as you can imagine. Uh, so this is a state highway within the city limits. It's something that um, at certain population thresholds, the city actually takes on the majority of the responsibility for the highway ultimately anyway. And we've been growing pretty rapidly and we're nearing uh, that mark. And they keep the legislature does keep pushing that out uh, slowly year after year, but, uh, but we're still approaching that mark. Uh, when you think about WashDOT and you think about I-90, uh, you know, I-5, SR-14 even, you know, into Vancouver, their level of congestion and problems that they're dealing with are at that bigger level. And so uh, funding from WashDOT specifically, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have any funding from WashDOT specifically on this project, even though it is a state highway. But all of that, I think, you know, again, from a priority perspective for WashDOT is, is kind of how that comes into play. Um, again, though, I think from a state perspective, when you look at it, the fact that we were successful with uh, $3.3 .3 million in grant money that's from the state programs that comes essentially from the same pot that WashDOT uses, uh, in essence, if you think of it all as state money. And then also the ability to even apply for those low interest loans that have actually helped us on a number of projects in campus. That's, you know, in a roundabout way, uh, no pun intended, uh, that's also, um, you know, funding from the state that helps. Hopefully that helps. I have one more question. Also. Um, was this competitively bid, this project? And is there the results of the bid and the specification made to, uh, available to the public? Yeah, so we are at essentially nearing final design. So the project has not gone out to bid yet. Uh, it will, so the project will be uh, competitively bid. That information, when we open those bids and we go to council to award the project to a contractor, that's all public. Um, certainly folks can follow that. Um, all of the, the bid tabs that they're called, people can see all the different um, uh, contractors' bids that, that bid on the project as a whole. Thank you very yep. much. And just for what it's worth, the design uh, piece of this was also a competitive uh, process that we go through in Washington State. It's qualification-based, but it's still a process where we advertised. Firms were able to submit uh, qualifications, we reviewed them, and then go through a process with the design firms as well. So. Good evening, John Lee. I'm up on Pro Hill. To follow up on that question, I've got, I've got two issues. Number one, we're looking to borrow between four and five million dollars between how much the final cost is and the bids are. Are we going to be able to pay that off with current taxes or is the city going to have to come to the citizens for a bond and how long is that loan and what are the terms of it? Yeah, good question. So the, the terms of the loan, I, Kathy's here as well, I think. Uh, I think it's a 1.58% interest rate on the loan, so pretty low interest. Uh, again, that's through the state in a program that they've had for a number of years. 20-year uh, term yes. on that uh, loan, and all of that can be repaid with existing revenues that the, the city is bringing in. Uh, and there's a, a number of different revenues that can be used to 
to pay that back. And currently we're going to use transportation impact fees as well as real estate excise tax, so it's not going to be on your property taxes. Thank you. Uh, my second issue in question is you showed 2040 and always good looking forward. We don't know exactly what growth will be. We don't know exactly where it will be. But in our community now, there are two major projects of growth being discussed. The most important one for a lot of people is the North Shore development. That we don't know how many homes, how many businesses, but it's going to add people. And right now, their only path out of that area primarily is going to be through this. So my thought and question, is this expandable? And the second issue is the Port of Camas Washougal is looking to do a serious expansion at the airport, also north of this. That's going to attract additional growth, which comes back to, is this expandable? Are you talking about the potential for four lanes through the area? How do we handle all that growth and the additional traffic as opposed to spending seven to eight million dollars and 15, 20 years from now we're going to have to rip out part of that because we now have another logjam. Yeah, so I'll, I, uh, actually Ellen is helping me out here so I can turn around and look at the questions again, right? So, uh, great question. Uh, I, we had similar questions as we went through the process. Uh, we, again, 2040 is what we looked at. That's, I guess what you would say, kind of a standard planning horizon in the infrastructure world is, you know, 20 years is about as far out as we can look to, to really kind of have a feel about what's going to happen. Uh, we can project out and see. Uh, we did have the same thought though, and so as far as the intersection being expandable, um, there is the option, go back to the So right now, um, as it sits, uh, there's one lane entering uh, from the north coming south, uh, and then you have obviously Lake Road, and then going um, on the southbound lake. So basically one, one lane coming southbound, that's been the key leg from a traffic standpoint that we've been watching. And so the roundabout, the location, and the way the islands are positioned on the uh, west side of the roundabout actually do allow for a second southbound uh, leg to come through there and through the through the roundabout itself. So it's it's made essentially to be expandable, uh, if, if you want to use that term. Uh, it's actually very similar to how we designed Sixth and Norwood. We had similar questions when we put that roundabout in. That roundabout is also, for what it's worth, made to be expandable uh, on the the would it be the eastbound lane, basically, or the eastbound direction can add another lane. So very similar thought process here. As a team, we thought, what happens if you go out 25, 30 years? Uh, are we setting ourselves up here for the future? And you know, we believe that we can uh, make this intersection a little bit bigger. Obviously, some of the plantings and some of the landscape areas get smaller as you add additional lanes, but uh, there is the ability to add more lanes to here. And then it's probably also worth noting from a corridor perspective. So the Everett corridor as a whole, uh, basically from the intersection going north. Um, you know, we've looked at that corridor a couple of different times. Uh, again, in the strategic plan that the city council has laid out, that's one of the priorities is to look at that corridor and, and plan for the future. That does tie into the, the North Shore effort that's happening. Uh, there's a, you know, as part of that effort, uh, moving forward, you know, maybe either we look at what we're calling Bridge Village, which is part of this Everett Corridor, and then beyond that into North Shore. So we do, uh, from a priority standpoint in transportation, I think we're, we're looking at the, the next priorities here from a citywide standpoint is this Everett Corridor and how it, we move traffic through here. I'm uh, Phil Williams, I'm at Lackness Summit up by the high school. Um, so I got a comment that goes into a question. Um, for just kind of with numbers in general, 
you're at a later stage in this design, and just kind of throughout the presentation, I appreciate the effort of everybody in the room. Um, there was just a lot of like, uh, when you're speaking of the trees, there's a, a number of trees will be removed, and then a number of them are in a position where they need to be removed, but I'd like to have those numbers. So just be good in, in every opportunity you have to try to throw those out of this stage. Um, and specifically to that, uh, we have our roundabout down there, and we have neighbors with a lot of roundabouts, you know, two, two put on 14, you mentioned about Brady. Um, so there's a lot of numbers there. I'd love to see everything in a line to see what we're spending versus what was spent, and uh, along with timelines as well, it's good to see the, the you know, comps in the, in the area for the work, uh, just to see what ours looks like compared. So uh, was that shared to you, what is that available now? Uh, from a cost perspective, and the other intersections, is that cost and timelines for roundabouts in the area? Um, I know everything's different. It, it is. That's <laughs> yep. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It, in fact, every it, it really depends, like any project, right, on <laughs> location, what the constraints are, what you're dealing with, and this is uh, this is a pretty unique area uh, for all the reasons that we talked about. But um, we have six the Norwood, for example, obviously that we that we built and we have numbers for. Uh, happy to share that and the time frames. Feels like they were pretty similar as far as about a year for design and uh, a year for construction. Yeah, but that's kind of roughly just, about the same. I'm just trying to get away from the feels like kind yeah. of stuff. So just is, is it possible to kind of get again like a straight line and, and even with like some of our friends in Washougal in Vancouver, um, with, with I'm sure some of those numbers are out there and you've yeah. probably seen them in the work that you did to, to research building up to it. Yeah, no, it's uh, possible to, to pull those together. We're certainly happy to, to share that. Again, six of the Norwood for us is the most readily available, but we can reach out to others and, and see what but, some but of the that goes up as a public, uh, I think it was like a Lake Road website. Yeah, there's a Lake Road website. Was On that website, website to, on yeah, to answer, um, can we, that's probably, uh, so the question was, can we put the cost information from six of the Norwood up on the, the Lake Road ever set, uh, Lake Road? Uh, every web page. And I, I yeah. it three years ago, so it's going to be Sure, that would yeah. sure be considered. We, so. All adults in the room, you can, you can tell us how to expand in there, right? Um, yeah. So, Rick just mentioned that the two roundabouts, the new ones on that side, So, I'll speak for Rick. Is that okay? Yeah. So, Rick Kennison is a traffic engineer for the Southwest region of Washdot, and Washdot built the roundabouts at SR14, and they were approximately seven and a half million dollars per roundabout, and they got the economy of scale of building two at a time for the con one contractor. One thing Rick mentioned is that they don't have any pedestrian facilities on theirs because they all go under the tunnel on the highway. So, sure. So it sounds like that'd be helpful to the, to the effort that you guys communicate. And I just, I just love to see the numbers. This is what I mentioned. And then just one follow up off of that, or second thing on mind. Um, you mentioned uh, that been considered the bridge at this point in time to double cost and expand the whole scope of the project. Uh, and then there was mention of uh, 500 and the, uh, all the extra bodies potentially coming in up north. Um, even though you couldn't do that work, did you explore what the expansion to the bridge or modification would look like? And does this design plan for that work if we're going to do that? Uh, great question. Let me answer your first question first, and that is the trees and the numbers. Uh, that analysis, the full analysis, uh, and including the tree inventory, is available on the website now, um, and uh, also with all the permitting information that we have. So that's totally available. You can go on, you can look at the different ratings. I think there was hazard, poor, fair, and good. Uh, so you can see each tree out there that was, that was identified. So that hopefully answers your first question. The second question, or third, uh, Great question on the bridge. We have looked at it in the past. I mentioned brief, just briefly a corridor analysis that we did in 15, 16, at least I think I mentioned it. Um, during that effort, we actually looked at the bridge and what that uh, could look like. It actually has to be raised because of the, the level of the water. Uh, a couple other, obviously, widening and allow for pedestrians and bicycles and that type of thing. So we have looked at that at a conceptual level during that analysis. And then we did take that into account as part of the evaluation process. In fact, uh, you know, some of the signal options, uh, in fact, maybe, I don't know if one of the roundabout options, 
reach that far or not. But that was part of the process is that with the different alternatives, uh, how fast could we transition back in and can we can we transition before we reach the bridge so that we didn't have to you know, include that in the entire project. So um, we've looked at that. This does transition in. It allows room actually in the future when the bridge project does occur that we can we have room to work and we can come back and tie into where this one is. In terms of your traffic modeling, if we do if we do expand and then change how the bridge looks, does that affect how this thing works in its current state? That, that's more what I was getting at. Does one consider the other? Yeah, no, it, it won't change how this functions or operates. The bridge itself, uh, you know, is, is a little bit further um, to the north, but again, they, they should work together, uh, which is fine. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yep. Yeah.
Hi, I'm Elise Alexander. I also live up near the hill, and I frequently walk here to Lackland's Lodge for yoga, so it would be nice to have the crosswalks available. Um, I was wondering with the landscaping, if the committee had ex um, investigated any possibility in the sidewalks that are going along by Round Lake, will there be any access to the Round Lake area from the sidewalks? That would be a good pedestrian access point for people to get into Round Lake area. So just so I understand, you would be talking through here? Yeah, so um, actually the, the sidewalk on the east side of the project, you know, comes right up to the parking lot. Um, in order to access Round Lake, you actually, this is the, you can't really see it on this yeah, photo, but the slough comes through here, right? So you, you know, unless we were to do a, a bridge of some sort, I guess, uh, I think the only option is to go around it through the parking lot and then onto the trail uh, behind that. So that's ring true for everything. I'm Rick Hoffman. I live in uh, Camas and the hills around the lake. This really isn't a question. I just want to thank the city of Camas. I've been to all the meetings. I truly believe, and I think most people, this is one of the best laid out programs that the city of Canvas has come up with, and also including all the homeowners for their questions and their ideas. So I commend you because I'm very thrilled about this project, and I think you've done a wonderful job. Thank you very much. The, the project team and the city council and there's been a lot of effort put into this one, so it's much appreciated. Hi, I'm Vicki Long. I live up by the high school. I guess that's the easiest way to say it. <laughs> I live across from what used to be Latinus Elementary. Um, this doesn't have anything to do really with the roundabout directly, but it does have to do with the bridge, bicycles, and pedestrians in today's world. I am wondering, what is the purpose of the new bridge that you built? Is that only for people, or is that for bikes, too? The, the utility bridge that crosses the canal? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I think it could be both. Yeah, I, I don't think there was an intention to exclude uh, either, but... So, why haven't those cement divide or the, the cement, whatever they are out there, the, um, there are the things that are used many times to divide a road, okay? So you guys kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. Why haven't those been moved to keep pedestrians and bicycles from using that? Because what I'm experiencing is that bicycles don't want to use the bridge. They don't want to use that little narrow path that they supposedly only were supposed to use. So they're out on the road. And so when that happens, we all have to slow down in our vehicles, especially with the new law that says that we have to give them at least three feet. So they have to go through, and we have to follow them until they get far enough down the corridor. And that's going to have an impact on a backup on the roundabout? Yeah, good, good question. Um, it it kind of goes back to the corridor itself and what we uh, try to accomplish on all of our major roads, which is, you know, ideally we would also have a bike lane or a specific area for bikes so that uh, both bikes and vehicles can move at the same time. Uh, obviously, if we don't have the bike lane, that is part of the uh, rules of the road, I guess, right, that we, we share with the bicycles. Um, it, it is, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it is more of a longer term corridor uh, issue that we need to address and, and try to get bike lanes. Uh, we didn't talk about bikes through the roundabout. It was something that was uh, specifically mentioned multiple times from folks as, as part of 
part of the evaluation criteria. Um, you know, the roundabouts, uh, and I might look to Greg or Amanis to help here, but uh, bikes can go through them two different ways. So they can essentially uh, act like a vehicle, like a car, and if they're comfortable, they can ride through the roundabout just like uh, a car does. And those are usually the, what I would say, the more experienced bikers, the, the kind of road warriors that are out uh, moving pretty quickly on their bikes and are used to this type of thing. The other option is that the roundabouts have specific areas as you come up to the roundabout where the bikes can get off the road onto the designated pathway. And the easiest one here to see, it's, it's the one on Lake Road. So if you're headed east on Lake Road coming towards the roundabout, uh, you see the sidewalk just kind of looks like it just starts in the middle of nowhere on that. Uh, far side of the top of the screen. That's the spot where the bikes can get off. Uh, they get onto the pathway, and then the, the actual sidewalks and pathways through the roundabout itself are wider, and part of that is to allow for the, you know, both bikes and pedestrians uh, to be able to, to go through there uh, and share that, essentially, as they go through the roundabout. Is that okay? So hopefully that, from a bike standpoint, we hadn't had that question, but I thought that was, uh, it was pretty important to folks as we went out in the community and asked people what they thought. Great. Any other questions, comments? And again, we're happy to stay. The project team will be here. Uh, we might be cleaning up a little bit, but there's the videos. If people didn't get a chance to see them close up, uh, it's certainly more than welcome to go over to the monitors there and, and check things out. It's, uh, it's it's actually pretty cool to, to watch those up close and see the little pedestrian come across and get a feel for how things operate. So it's a, a good tool to use for this type of thing. And with that, we thank everybody for coming out and your participation in the process. <laughs>